Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. My name is Stephen Jodder, and joining me today, as always, is Jake Watrova and Armando Fai. On today's episode, we dig in deeper into Mexico's 3 nail thumping of the United States. Listeners, if you haven't done so, check out our hot reaction to the loss on yesterday's episode. Hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, follow us at Uncle Sam Soccer Pod. Now, fellas, yesterday we really didn't talk much about pleasantries. But, Armand, you're talking about the pace of play, which we have mentioned last week on the show. Again, affecting your ability to watch American football. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's cool and all. I think the uh, adver- the invention of NFL Red Zone is, like, really cool, right? But, like, for just, like, watching a full game, like, geez, man. Like, right now, like, the Cowboys games are around, like, three like 20 i guess and it's about like 355 central time so we'd be almost entering you know the end of the first half you know getting to halftime whenever it's nine the end of the first quarter i i think there's still like five minutes left like it's the pace of play i don't know especially when you come back from watching a lot of soccer like after watching the world cup i i i, I can admit i almost watched every game the it, it, it took me so long to get back to like the use of like the flow or like how slow an like a american football game is and I guess I'm having that transition now, sadly. Yeah. Listeners, at the Uncle Sam Soccer Pod, if you have any issues with pace of play, we want to hear it. Jake, what about you? You you find this question surrounding American football pace of play an issue? Because soccer clearly has it solved. It is 90 minutes of game time unless it's a tournament. You have a 15-minute halftime. That's it. You're It's a two-hour window. You, you know exactly when the game's going to end. This is no, hey, babe, there's three minutes left in the fourth quarter. It could take half an hour with instant replay, timeouts, the two-minute warning, and, gosh, freaking challenge flags. You guys, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. It's just more time for drinking. That's all that means. (laughs) It's just more time to booze. I guess. But no, I, I get it. I get it. You say there's three minutes left in the game. When really there's about a half hour left in the game, <laughs> with all the timeouts, with all the stoppages in place, with all the two minute warnings, with the TV coaches' timeouts. challenges, TV timeouts. Yes, it does take forever. But I'm just trying to be Mr. Positive over here. Just more time for drinking, and I know our listeners like to drink. We all like to drink, so let's, uh, you know, hey, toast to you guys, toast to the listeners. Enjoy your uh, football Sunday, and uh, let's talk a little national team, huh? Yeah. So, USA, zero. Mexico, three. Goals, Chicharito, Eric Gutierrez, and Uriel Antuna all score. We have our emotional reaction on yesterday's episode. Today, again, is more tactical. Guys, starting lineups, guess who was the most capped player for the U.S. men's national team? I can't guess. I'm looking at the notes right now, but Jake, can you guess? <laughs> I'm also looking at it, but just for the just for the just for the bit, just for the segment here, I'm going to say Christian Pulisic. So uh, Stephen, so Stephen uh, can drop a bomb and surprise everybody about yeah, who he really well, is. It's not necessarily a surprise of the name; it's the amount. Jossie Zardes, Jake's boy over there, 52 caps with the national team. That is a tremendous amount for this guy. And he scores the wackiest goals. My goodness. But seriously, a a lineup that included Jossie Zardes, Christian Pulisic, Will Trapp, Zach Steffen, Weston McKinney, Alfredo Morales, Aaron Lawn, Walker Zimmerman, Reggie Cannon, Tyler Boyd, and Sardino Dest, who made his debut. This was the youngest lineup for the U.S. men's national team in 2019. The average cap was 19. Jossie Zardes almost triples that. So you want to talk about game day experience. And Josh Cesardes is the most experienced man out there starting for the U.S. Men's National Team Friday night against Mexico. Fellas, 
looking at this lineup, you had to say, hmm, this this could be an interesting team here. I know there are question marks around Zardes and Trap, but overall, you, you give the youngster Dest some game day experience. You, you like that. Uh, the the pairing of Walker Zimmerman and Aaron Long has been pretty damn good thus far. In, in fact, heading into this match, when they are paired up, the team is perfect 5 0 and 0 without conceding a goal. No, so, Steven, it was intri- it was intriguing. I think you're right. Like, right? Because you get like a guy against Dest, you get him to see first time for the senior national team. You guys see Reggie Kennan had a really strong gold cup. You guys see Alfredo Morales, who you know hasn't been a part of the national team for quite a bit, and he uh, you know gets gets some gets some time you know next to a good old Will Trap. You saw Pulisic, you know, again more on the wing. Uh, you know Tyler Boyd, he kind of disappeared towards the end of the gold cup. It was an interesting team to say at least on paper. Speaking of Alfredo Morales, Jake. Do you know the last time that he played for the U.S. men's national team? I sure do. Actually, I don't, but I know it was three years ago. May 16th, 2016. My God. Hey, it's cool. It's cool to have these players. And, Amarni, you're absolutely right. It was intriguing. You you had a ton of different storylines. But then it just went south. I don't even know how to describe it. The first 15 or 20 minutes or so, the U.S. was fine, I thought. I thought they were – I thought they looked up for the challenge. I thought they looked up for the game. They domi- I don't want to say they dominated possession, but they held a good amount of the ball. Uh, they had they had a couple of uh, okay chances with that Serginio Dest uh, shot where he cut inside into the uh, top of the box there and put that shot on the Mexican goal that was, a, that was saved. But the U.S. looked fine for the first 15 or 20 or so minutes, and then all of a sudden – I don't know what changed. I don't, I don't know if there was a tactical adjustment made by Tata Martino or what, but Mexico really, really just enforced their will on the U.S. men's national team. And it all kind of started with, uh, with Zach Steffen there being unable to make a pass out of the back and the U.S. just not being able to break down Mexico's high press. And we saw it time and time and time again just turnovers after turnovers out of the back. You had the Tecatito chance there early on where he should have scored. The U.S. was fortunate, by the way, to only lose 3-0. This should have been a 4 or 5 nil win for uh, El Tree. But you had a Tecatito chance that probably should have been scored that he just sent over the bar. There was a few other chances that the Mexicans have where they weren't able to convert. And... It, it felt like it was just all one-way traffic for Mexico, really just pushing numbers forward. Uh, the U.S. unable to break down the press. And when they were turned over, Mexico just having all the numbers in the attacking third. And it, it just wasn't a good result. And I just think it's funny that Greg Berhalter thinks it was a, a good performance by the U.S. or it was an improved performance from what we saw a couple months ago in the Gold Cup. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the soundbite here in a moment. Listeners at Uncle Sam Soccer Pod. But Armand, we, we talked a lot about adjustments last time around against Mexico in the Gold Cup final. And I was here on the show and defended more so what Greg Berhalter did. The substitutions were a disaster in that game. However, I thought Greg Berhalter somewhat said, you know what, I don't know what adjustments to make. But it seems like in this game, he should have made adjustments. Yeah, I mean, it it clearly wasn't working, right? It clearly just wasn't clicking. Uh, Jake mentioned it. Zach Steffen's passes, man. Oof. Oof, that was just not good enough. They they, they weren't good enough. And it allowed Mexico to gain the ball higher up the pitch. They didn't know what to do. They they were kind of lost. They don't do it their their feet. And I think the big thing... Uh, though, Steven, well, I think we agree he should have made adjustments. I'm actually okay with him not making adjustments. Call me crazy. Call me a little crazy. I don't think you're that crazy for is... saying that because it's a friendly Be... – admit, admit, Exactly. Admit, why not go screw it? We're not making adjustments. You play through play it. Play through it. Try to learn. Exactly. Especially because I'm thinking, of, thinking about it through the mind of Burhalter. He wants to impose his system, right? Look, 
if I'm a coach and it's a friendly, if this was the Gold Cup final, yes, you change it up completely. Hey, let's play more direct. Let's go, you know, try to find the head of Giassi or, you know, someone else. And let's, like, play more direct that way. But since this was a friendly, I'm not sure if an adjustment uh, is necessarily the, the right, you know, step. I think I'm actually okay with them saying, you know what, try to play through this, try to learn, try to advance. But, yeah, Greg had some really interesting comments post-game about the match. Let's, let's hear what he said. You know, from my perspective, and you guys are going to think I'm crazy, I'm, I'm happier about this game than in the Gold Cup Final. Because in the Gold Cup Final, I, f- I felt like all we did was play the ball long, and that was our only solution. And now, at least we tried to, at least we tried to play in the way that we're envisioning. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when I look at the game, you know, it's 3 nothing. To me, that's not a fair reflection of what the performance. Well, Greg, I do think you're a little crazy for saying that, I guess. But, look, I I actually do understand where he's coming from, though. I understand it. Because in the Mexico match, they resulted to... They kind of drifted away from the game plan, right? They just resorted to long ball. They, they kind of resorted back to their old tendencies. They did not play through the pressure. Now, they did that. And they played through the pressure. They did not resort to their old tendencies in the match against Mexico where they lost 3-0. So as a coach, you can say, okay, the concepts were there. We're actually trying the concepts. I'm proud of it as a coach. However, it, you, there has to be a better way, right? Like we didn't play that well, but we really you know, honed in our concepts. We're going to take a look and see if it's the right concepts moving on. But I'm glad we stick to the concepts even through a- adversity, we're going to maybe adjust some things going into Uruguay. I don't think you, you can come out and say, look, you know, we played, you know, we're happier about the performance because it looks bad with the media, looks bad with fans. And more importantly, it does not, it, the scoreline was 3 0. And it, honestly, it, it could have been worse. And it's fans insulting. aren't stupid, it's right? A, it's an insulting yes. statement yes. to the fans, basically saying, ha ha, suckers. Don't read the scoreline. I know everything. That's what Burhalter's saying right there. I got it. Don't worry about it. When people sit there and go, Greg, you haven't beaten anybody important this year. Your team is all over the map. You you got by Carousel by a scoreline of what? Jake, do you remember the, the scoreline versus Carousel? What was it again? Was it uh, 1-0? I believe so. It was one nothing. The, the problem is... Greg, that you haven't had performances to sit there and go, look, I'm actually pretty happy with this performance because we've had performances that we've excelled in. I I really don't know why he said that line and why he went it about that way. He was so defensive. It's just not a good look. And Armand, you're right. You're right. He, He could have gone it about a different way and sit there and go, look, it's a friendly. At the end of the day, yeah, we lose to Mexico. But I'm here to make sure this U.S. men's national team is ready for qualifiers and ultimately 2022. I'm not here to beat Mexico on September 6th, 2019 in a friendly. Steven, I agree. I do think it's a bit of a slap in the face. This is from Beralter to the fans just saying, yeah, you guys are overreacting. Don't worry about it. I got it all figured out. 3-0? It should have been three nil. It should have been like one nil. We didn't lose that bad. No, Greg, you should have lost five nil. Terrible performance, and I think it says a lot that he's already fighting with the media, kind of in a way, where he's saying, "Ah, well, I know the narrative you're gonna push. Well, let me tell you why it's BS." I think it's concerning. I think he's feeling the pressure a little bit when he has comments like that. He did, he did fight with the media though, right, Jake? Isn't that what we like we were reading he did have on a, Twitter a or something like that? He did have a confrontation with somebody in the media, and then I, so I, I have an it. account of what happened. Uh, I talked to my oh, a buddy of mine who Ooh, uh, was at the scoop. press conference. Yes, tell yeah. Us, so I was talking about buddy who was at the press conference, and he uh, basically was asking a question like, "What did you tell your teams?" I'm paraphrasing. "What did you tell your team at halftime?" Uh, you know, after being overrun by Mexico. And uh, apparently he was like, Greg was like, I-, I don't think we were overrun. Like, it's a really weird statement to make. And he's like, a reporter basically, like, Greg, my bad. Like, I don't mean to use that word or something like that. And then Greg turns, I think, to Grant Wall and is like, hey, uh, do you think we were overrun uh, in the first half? And 
Grant looks at Greg's like, hey, don't bring me into this. Like, I- I'm not part of this. <laughs> like, this is between you and the other guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, apparently the guy, the reporter, and the picture that Salazar posted is actually him apologizing to Burhalter, but I, 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 allegedly uh, Burhalter didn't really accept his apology. Oh my I, God! Uh, Are you kidding me? Is this uh, this can't so, be true? Like that? I, this... I'm telling you, this is a from what I heard. Like this is like, like this is what happened. Uh, and okay. the media and, and and the media was saying, "Hey, Greg, like we don't agree." Like like. They they were kidding, and he just kind of went back and forth. He seemed, uh, from what I heard, annoyed. I was trying to find the press conference. I couldn't find it. Listeners, after we recorded the episode, we were able to obtain the audio from Greg Berhalter's press conference following the 3-0 defeat to Mexico. To provide you with more context, here is the exchange between Berhalter and a member of the media. Greg, um... Obviously, as you said, young group, uh, they were trying to uh, get them going confidently. What did you say to them at halftime after it looked like they got basically ran over a lot of one-touch passing by Mexico? What did you say to them at halftime in the locker room? Wow, was that, is that what you guys think happened in the first half? Is that what's happening? Grant, what do you think? They ran us over in the first half? <laughs> that's surprising it's surprising he said that because I thought it was back and forth I thought it was ba- I thought it was a back and forth game I thought we had some really good moves I thought that we were ge- we were very aggressive getting after them we forced forced their goalie into a lot of long balls that they didn't want to play we won all those long balls I don't think they won one long ball from us in the first half it's a run over to me that's not fair I didn't say that Going on towards the back end of the first half, and what were you trying to say to them at halftime just to get them going to get back on the front foot in the start of the second half? We talked about how they were pressing, how they were releasing their, their wingers to our center backs, how they were releasing their um, full backs to our full backs. We talked about that, we talked about an adjustment we could make, and then um, and I said, Keep going, guys, it's one nothing, keep going. We're going to get a goal, and we got to keep playing. Listeners, let us know what you think of the exchange on Twitter, at UnkSamSoccerPod. Now, let's get back to the show. He, he needs to go. I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting the flag in the ground right now. Greg Berhalter out. Hashtag Berhalter out. That's, that's unbelievable that he is now calling out media members who say, hey, you got all played by Mexico, and then goes, hey, Grant Wall, did I get all played by Mexico? Like, putting Grant Wall on the spot like that's supposed like unbelievable and that just shows you that just shows you i'm gonna put on my tinfoil ted uh here hat on that just shows you how much u.s soccer media is in the back pocket at least some members of u.s soccer's media is in the back pocket of the federation where they're gonna go to hey grant wall you this he this bozo over here saying we got over on my mexico you believe in that good for grant if he said like leave me out of this good for grant Good for no, Grant Wall for saying though. that. Anybody with an actual eye and watch that game knows damn well. If you're going to say, well, they played well for the first 15 minutes, great. They played well for the first t- first 15 minutes. But they were outplayed from the 20th minute on consistently. They were dominated by Mexico. And for Greg Berhalter to basically call out this reporter and demand like an apology or to put him on the spot or to almost embarrass him in front of his uh, – in front of the other media members in that in that press conference, I think it's very unprofessional, Greg Berhalter. I'm sorry. And Ar- shame Armand, on that. Shame you're... on the reporter for apologizing to him too. Armand, you are in locker rooms. You are at press conferences regularly. You are on the phone with people in U.S. soccer and Major League Soccer. What is it? What is your reaction to that? I mean, well, it's one of those things where it's just not right, right? Like, look, if a coach respects you, he's going to respect your opinion as well, right? If he respects you, you he, you might see things differently, but he knows you're a reporter and you know he's a coach. Uh, and you you know like, when things go bad, you're going to ask questions and things do good. You're going to – it's it's a it's a mutual relationship, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like that. Especially, you know, when a coach asks me the questions, you know, like, oh, look, what do you think of the match? 
I'm more than willing to give them a an exam and you know how I feel and what I think, and I try to do that in the questions I ask. But I'm not obligated to. This guy's not obligated to like you know explain and you know to bring other guys in it. It's like yeah, it's like you said like you know like if a kid's making fun of someone, oh like you know like oh wow, just you see what this idiot asked me? Like can you believe that? And like you can't like most reporters what they do is if the the player or coach asks like hey look like do you believe this? They'll say, hey, I'm asking you the question. Like, this is what I saw. This is what I believe. I'm asking you. Like, you can ask me and we can talk about it. But I do think it's very weird. Uh, I, and personally, I don't like it. I think it's a bad look. And I think it's petty. Why Why didn't you just take it in a stride? Why do, you, why, do you, why do you have to, you know, fight back? Why couldn't you just been like, you know, like what I told the guys, why do you just ignore it? Right? Like, you're making a, big, a bigger situation than it actually has to be. Here's a burhalter on what the narrative is following USA Mexico at this press conference when obviously when the reporters were pressing him on the performance of the national team. I see where the narrative is going now, right? It's why are we playing the way we're playing? We don't ha- that's the first question. The second thing is we don't have the players to do it, right? That's what all you guys are thinking. And to me it's about developing players. Clearly he's on the defensive. He, he knows it. And my question there is, is he taking the bullet for his players? Is he doing the right thing in that situation, trying to cover for his players when they went out there and embarrassed themselves, embarrassed Greg Berhalter, embarrassed U.S. soccer, and this progress or this development, this plan Greg Berhalter has? Yeah, he he's taking the bullet. But in and, 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 and the same sense, though, he's the reason why the bullets being fired at his players and i think that's because of the system they're playing here and i think as long as they're playing the system greg is going to have to face the music and be asked these questions and he's going to have to continue to deflect the questions or or come to his players defense or fall on the grenade whatever phrase you want to use until either a he's fired or b the system clicks and i don't i don't know if this team is capable of playing a style like Man City. I don't know if they're able to. And But here, I, I think him taking the bullets here for his players is exactly what the players need. Yes, I went on a rant yesterday that there's no leadership in that locker room. And I will stand by it. And I don't think that's going to change for the time being. I, I genuinely don't know who in that locker room you go to when this team isn't performing well or the results are going south. Greg Berhalter can, can, is doing all he can. He's being very honest when it comes to player selection. He's telling the fan base it's about development. Calm down. Put your pants back on. Just because a player does well for two games in the Champions League doesn't mean that he's the next Messi. Like, put your pants back on and calm down U.S. soccer. Okay? However, on the other hand, Armand... He's very testy with the media, and that's a little bit worrying. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. The U.S. media has to be critical, right? This team just missed a World Cup. This team literally just missed a World Cup. And lost the Gold Cup final. And lost the Gold Cup final. So you can't tell me that the media can't be critical, especially after a poor performance like that, especially, you know, after talking about this system and stuff. You know the one thing I've really noticed? I just can't believe how no one's talked about how they've, they've shifted away from the inverted right back. They've shifted away from it completely. Why is that? Like, why is it? Why is that the case? No one I, – I, I don't know if we've got an answer or anything like that. Is that because Tyler Adams isn't in there? Is that because Reggie Kansner? there? Is it because it doesn't work? Like, what's the reasoning behind it? We don't know. And the thing is, is that – the thing is, we the media has to be asking those questions, or else you're just going to sit here and, and you have to put the pressure. Like what happened with the U.S. elections, nothing changed until the until these guys, you know, started trying to change things. And that's with the media pressure. That's that's what happens, right? So there has to be some more talk. I completely agree. I I I, I don't like the testy relationship they have. Uh, he has to kind of. If I'm Greg, I'm kind of ignoring it. If I'm not. Well, do it better, I guess. 
Listeners, question of the day, and this was sent in by one of our good listeners, Harry. Shout out to him. My question to Unc Sam Soccer Pod, what will it take to bring the excitement back to the U.S. men's national team? A change at the top of USSF or as simple as better results? That's a great question. I mean, Berhalter talks about progress. Here's him talking about this progress post-game. We're, we're making progress. Uh, you're not, you know, that's not going to be your narrative right now, and I understand that. But internally, we believe we're making progress. I do not know what it will take to bring back the excitement to the U.S. men's national team. I don't think it, it's going to happen until the World Cup, until they make a deeper run, until they capture the nation like the U.S. women did this past World Cup. Performances in World Cup qualifying or in Gold Cup or in friendlies versus Italy or whoever it may be, a, a world-renowned team isn't going to get the diehard baseball fan to tune into the U.S. men's national team and maybe try out soccer. It just won't. And until then, the excitement won't be there because it's a bunch of soccer fanboys who right now have very negative opinion of this national team. I, mean, I think... Gonna... Oh, I'm sorry, Jake. You can go ahead. All right. I, was ready to I come think... I think the reason why there's no excitement, and this is actually a Stephen Jodoran take, I feel, and I think that, Stephen, you're going to agree with me on this one. Oh, boy. There is nobody within this side that really embodies like the, the, the American spirit, if you will, that when they pull on that shirt, they're there to kick ass and take names. I felt that way when Clint Dempsey played. Like Clint Dempsey was all was there, represent America. The all-American boy. Demarcus Beasley, Landon Donovan, guys like that. You felt that, you know, they were playing for something more than just. They had the, a chip on the, their shoulder. They were they were scrappy. They were they played for more than just the name in the back of the jersey. Steve they were there Tarondo. for the press. God, what a generation of players and we had. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think there is a single player right now that embodies that chip on their shoulder. Well, I'm looked down upon because I'm American and we don't play soccer like the rest of the world. And I'm going to show you that just because I'm American, I can play soccer and I'm going to kick your ass at this game. Uh, you know, nobody like nobody like Clint Dempsey. Like Clint Dempsey's like the Tyler, perfect example. I think honestly, I really do think Tyler Adams it could be the solution to this problem because this quickly also coincides with the lack of leadership. Could you imagine there's somebody in that field that was just cared from a, a tremendous amount about the result, especially against Mexico. Remember when Matt Miazga made the short joke? Like, people loved that. Why? Because he cared. There was passion. People were like, all right, I can get behind that. I'll, I'll, I'll ride the battle with him, game day. Alfredo Morales did something. I, I, he didn't do the short joke, but Alfredo Morales, now granted, I don't think he's national team quality, but he was fiery on Friday night. He actually showed a little bit of passion, but he was the only player that I felt – that had that passion, that had that fu mentality. I don't, I don't like Mexico, and th- I just don't think there's anybody else on this roster that, that, that has that. And I think fans know that. And I think fans feed off of that. And I think until there is that person that is all about the red, white, and blue, and you know, and just proving people wrong that Americans can play soccer. I think there's going to be this disinterest amongst fans, and definitely amongst casual fans. Like if you're a if you're somebody who doesn't watch soccer and you tune into the U.S. men's national team and no one looks like they're there for the red, white, and blue, well, why would you care? Well, I actually I have a different take, and this might sound a little more sad for our listeners. I don't think the excitement is going to come until qualifying for 2026. Genuinely, um, that's when a lot of these younger players, hopefully, that you know that everyone's you know, I know we we hype them up, but they they seem like they do have some talent. And they do have some swagger. Uh, they're going to be kind of entering their primes. And we'll also have some other players, you know, coming up as well. Pulisic will be, you know, certainly has plenty of more experience underneath his belt. And plus, I mean, I think the excitement will, I think, come naturally and organically then. I mean, you have a World Cup on your home soil. Uh, well, actually, I don't think they even have to qualify because they automatically qualify as a host country. I think the excitement is going to come through, I, I think, there. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with these next four years, but I, I don't feel like there will be – that much more excitement, you know, especially, I know it's early to say, but for his 2022 team, because, I mean, look, I mean, there, there just isn't there just isn't that excitement. I don't know. There just isn't. I, like Jake said, 
there isn't anyone that like shows like the heart, right? Reggie Cannon, I think, does. Uh, I think you can name a couple of players as well. Pulisic does at times, but McKenny, you can even argue, but it's not like an overwhelming majority. Um, McKenny you know, like some... has a short fuse, and I I think mm-hmm. people can really get behind that if he becomes right, yeah. a, a just a bigger personality. But I also think the U.S. lack personality. Like, where is that person that just, wow, like, Christian Pulisic just doesn't have that personality. But who's that guy that is just flamboyant, who who wears crazy hats at press conferences, who has the Ferraris, who people either love or hate him, right? But he's just a personality that the media can't keep their the camera off of him. Think about LeBron James. You either love the guy or you hate him, but he's a personality. He's Taco Tuesday. ESPN had a huge bit on Taco Tuesday, for God's sakes. Who is that guy in U.S. men's soccer? They don't. They don't have it, Stephen. They really don't. Uh, there isn't. There isn't that guy. I think, for lack of a better word, they 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 don't have that fiery personality that you know, or that fun personality that interacts in media. Uh, they're kind of because you know, U.S. sports are very you know, passion driven. You know. The athletes are the stars, whatever. That's why a lot of you know the European guys want to come here because they they like they like that culture. I don't think there's anyone in the national team that has that, to be honest with you. And I don't know if we'll see that for a long time, unless some of these young guys come in with the drip, you know. Hey, listeners, one quick note: we'll be back Thursday, not Wednesday. We'll be chatting U.S. men's national team and MLS. Well, there you have it, listeners. Question of the day via our good friend at Rami Cole. What will it take to bring excitement back to the U.S. men's national team? Will it be a change at the top of U.S. soccer, or is it simply better results? Let us know at Unc Sam Soccer Pod. And one other thing from at Unc Sam Soccer Pod, you guys gave us some responses here. We ran a poll after the game Friday night. The question was, is Greg Berhalter still in charge after World Cup qualifiers? 32% of you said yes, while a whopping 68% said no. A lot of doom and gloom right now within the U.S. men's national team fan base. And speaking of the U.S. men's national team, they take on Uruguay tonight in St. Louis. Don't know what time it's going to kick off at. It's probably on Fox, so they're going to say 7 o'clock, but maybe it'll be 8.30 as they do with their MLS coverage, but nonetheless, seven o'clock St. Louis against Uruguay. You can follow the show on Twitter. At Jake, can I, um, can I interrupt? Go ahead. The national team roster was reduced to 20 players as John Brooks, Sean Johnston, Weston McKinney, Alfredo Morales, Christian Pulisic, and Zach Steffen were released back to their clubs after the game against Mexico. Don't expect much of a, a, a massive victory. Like I, I think we could just, based on the roster, go into this match and say, if they lose, they didn't have their best players. No, Genuinely. stop calming down Pitchfork Nation. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just They're gonna saying. They're going to get blown out. Let's go. Let's go, Uruguay. All right? Let's. I want all the heat on this manager and this federation right now. All right. That's, 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 all, that's all I'm saying. So when they lose 5-0 to Uruguay tonight, I'm, I'm, Armand, I'm not I mean, gonna, seriously, I'm not what is your expectation it, tonight? But... Josh Sargent start, and I'm happy. All right, there you go. Play the, play the kids. You're a very kids. simple man. You're going to get Jossie's artisan like it. Anyway, you can follow the show on Twitter. Oh, at Unc Sam Pax and Pomico starting? <laughs> Sorry, Jay. No, he's not ready. He doesn't play at Ajax yet or whatever the hell Berhalter said. <laughs> he doesn't play said. Champions League games. He doesn't play Champions League games, I guess. You can follow Armand Kafai at Armand Kafai. He's got hot FC Dallas takes. You can follow Steven Jodoran at Steven Jodoran, and you can follow myself at Jake Petroba. For Steven and Herman, I'm Jake. I'll talk to you guys next time.